introduce uh, Dr. Christopher Argus, uh, who is an assistant professor at, in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Louisiana State University. Um, Chris has been a longtime Gamma user, and we've exchanged multiple emails and multiple phone calls about the work that he had been doing over his career. And we thought that, you know, based off all this uh, communication, uh, it would be nice to have him and host him here um, and share and have him share his research with the Gamry family. Um, and so, you know, that's where we are. And with that, I'll just hand it over to Chris. Chris. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jerome. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here today to tell you a little bit about our research at LSU. And the title of my talk is Electrochemical Engineering with Thin Film uh, Polymer Electrolytes. Let's see, there we go. Um, so the overview of my talk today uh, will cover um, uh, th two different areas, roughly. I was hoping to do this third one on uh, some of work that we do that relates to ion transport deionization, whether it's for water treatment or nutrient recovery uh, or carbon valorization. Um, and we, we do some fundamental work in trying to understand the activity coefficients of ions in thin film polymer electrolytes, but given the time constraints and the breadth of the first two topics, I won't be able to cover it. But if you wanna learn more, uh, feel free to email me uh, or uh, we've published two papers on this topic. Uh, we actually use the EQCM that we get from Gamry for this work, but I'll tell you about some of the other stuff where we do use some of the Gamry instruments for our other projects uh, today. So first, uh, the first part of our talk relates to high temperature polymer electrolyte membranes based on ion pair materials. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit later. But uh, we have these new remarkable membranes that uh, expand the temperature and humidity range for fuel cells and electrochemical pumps. And our, sort of our observation of this, those devices, how you really improve them, you need better electrodes. And what uh, we found out as well as other people have found out is that the binder for the electrodes, the ionomer binder has, um, a, a plays a critical role in the performance of the electrodes. And so we've sort of been doing some fundamental investigations, trying to understand uh, the electrochemical properties of thin film ionomers that would mimic uh, uh, their structure within electrodes. Um, so a little bit about uh, LSU, Louisiana State University. We're the state flagship university located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the state capital. We have uh, over 34,000 students and 1,200 endowed oak trees. That's one of my favorite parts of the campus. This is the main old quad. Uh, we have these buildings in the old Italian Renaissance. Um, and then uh, in Baton Rouge, this is the state capitol building. And from this view, you'll see behind you a very, very large refinery. It's the fourth largest refinery in the United States, ran by Exxon. And that refinery will process about a half a million uh, barrels of oil a day. And um, that is just one of many chemical plants that you'd find around the state. So we graduate about 140 under, uh, chemical engineers every year with a bachelor's degree that would uh, go work in various chemical plants in the Gulf region. And so uh, even though we're a small state, we rank second in chemical manufacturing. So I, now I wanna tell you a little bit about our research group. And so um, we sort of do uh, both fundamental and applied work. So we work with uh, model systems with long range order through self-assemble block polymers, And we try to eliminate uh, uh, structural defects at the mesoscale and uh, perhaps by creating long range order and perfection, we can use these systems to give us some information how the mesostructure affects transport kinetic rates and thermodynamic properties. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we also make translational materials for actual devices. So what I'm showing you here is uh, a paper that we published uh, that came out late last year or early this year on these bipolar membranes that we use. Um, we just study them more fundamentally, but we're starting to use them for CO2 electrolysis now. And uh, I have a background from my block copolymer work in my postdoc in lithography. So we do micro patterning via soft lithography and make high surface area interfaces. And this turns out to improve the performance of these bipolar membranes and electrochemical devices. We also make porous ionic conductors. These are ion exchange resin particles. So um, that are immobilized with the ionomer binder that's often used in fuel cells. And so we've used this for 
Uh, water deionization this is the paper that came out last year, uh, Nature's NPJ Clean Water. And then uh, we fabricate membrane electrode assemblies where we append electrodes on top to high temperature polymer electrolyte membranes. Uh, one of the ways we do this is through an ultrasonic spray deposition system as shown here. And then those translational materials, we uh, not only do we characterize the properties of these materials, right, but we uh, integrate them into devices. Uh, some of these devices we build ourselves with our machine chop. Uh, this is a membrane capacitive deionization unit for our electrochemical separations. And then uh, we have the fuel cell um, and flow battery test stands from Scribner. But we actually oftentimes use these, uh, what I like to call gas handling test station or liquid handling test station for uh, gas phase or liquid phase electrolysis. Um, and so that sort of gives a broad overview of the things we can do in my research group at LSU. And so now what I would like to do is talk, tell you a little bit about our work in HDPEM, high temperature polymer electrolyte membranes. Um, and so uh, I think the last time I gave this talk was a month ago and a lot has changed in one month, it seems. Um, uh, it's I almost, I think, in the United States, inevitable that you will have an electric vehicle in your future. Um, General Motors uh, last year announced that all the electric uh, vehicles that they'll manufacture by 2035 will be electric. Uh, Tesla is quite remarkable within a decade. Um, a startup company has now become the most valuable car company. I mean, I know that's through stock, stock you know, a stock performance evaluation, but um, they're doing quite well, needless to say. And then uh, we, some of our work we do with Toyota. And uh, of course, Toyota was the first company, one of the first companies to release and sell a fuel cell vehicle. This is the Toyota Mirai. This is their second version. It has a 400 mile range. And back to this idea of why I think I see an electric vehicle in your future. Um, so I think it was like a week or two ago, maybe two weeks ago, uh, President Biden announced uh, that the United States by 2030 will reduce 50% uh, of its greenhouse gas emissions from its 2005 levels. And uh, what that sort of means from my viewpoint is that vehicle electrification is critical. And that's because there are some sectors like an in industry or aviation, like having a 50% greenhouse gas reduction is gonna be challenging in that short time frame. So to sort of, you know, make up for like their lag, right, their ability to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, like we're going to really need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the, um, you know, transportation sector by vehicles, uh, like motorized vehicles. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, the question is, will fuel cells make it? Is there a role for fuel cells given the proliferation of battery electric vehicles, right? I think in 2019, something like eight and a half million electric vehicles were sold in the United States, whereas like fuel cell electric vehicles, I think it was like, you know, less than 10,000. Um, and so those are orders of magnitudes and difference of their, um, the sales of those vehicles. But, you know, when do fuel cells really make sense? And that's sort of what this um, slide is telling us. And it really comes down to uh, the required electrical energy of the vehicle. And this value here is wrapped up in the vehicle range, how far the vehicle can go and how heavy it is. And so if we think of a truck, right, a, a class A trailer truck, which is really heavy and needs to go a long distance, and you need to re, uh, fuel quickly, um, that heavy truck that needs to go long distance is gonna have a very, very high required electrical energy. And then uh, with any type of transportation, what you're ultimately concerned with is the specific energy um, you know, density, whether it's normalized per mass or volume. Okay, here we have it normalized per mass. And right, we don't want the vehicle to just be, log, you know, carrying a battery or a fuel cell system around. We want to maximize this value. And so when we look at battery electric vehicles, this came from a very, uh, it's a fairly old article, but relevant by General Motors, Fred Wagner, Mark Mathias. You know, the, the first version of the Chevy Vault was about 100 watt hours per kilogram, right? And then if you look at two different types of uh, Tesla, so I've like edited this graph from General Motors. Uh, you can see here they can get about 150 watt hours per kilogram for the Model 3. And then if you use a more premium model, you can get, you know, about 280 watt hours per kilogram. And then a fuel cell, right, um, you know, for small vehicles, it doesn't really make sense. The specific en energy density isn't all that good because of all the ancillary units, the hydrogen storage tank, humidifier, radiator, et cetera. But then when you need a very, very large uh, electrical energy where you have to go long distance 
and, and carry uh, a lot of weight, uh, that specific energy density does better with a fuel cell. It scales better, right? And so that's where fuel cell technology sort of makes sense. And um, again, the sort of go back to this article by Fred Wagner, and Mark Mathias, um, you know, they sort of predicted this over 10 years ago, uh, you know, that there needed to be continued investment in both battery and electric vehicles for full vehicle electrification. So even though there's a, a you know, in the last year, there, a lot of things have changed uh, from both industry and from the government. Um, they all go on the, uh, to say that, you know, one future plausible scenario. So, you know, this is, uh, they did a really good job in terms of prophecy is that they sort of argued that smaller cars are better for batteries while um, larger trips, longer trips and larger vehicles are better for fuel cells. Um, and so I thought that was pretty interesting, you know, over 10 years ago, um, that type of uh, marketplace ecosystem where fuel cells would be for, you know, uh, shipping goods uh, for heavy duty vehicles would be sort of where it's headed and batteries would be for more like sedan vehicles. And so uh, up to now, I haven't even explained uh, what a fuel cell is, perhaps for this audience, because people are interested in electric chemistry, obviously know what a fuel cell is, but sometimes when I go out and give seminars at chemical engineering departments and everybody works in electrochemistry, but uh, like all electrochemical devices, it has two electrodes and an electrolyte. And so at the anode here, you can feed in a hydrogen fuel where you oxidize it to release two electrons. And then uh, those electrons move externally through the cell and they power whatever you want. And then this proton exchange membrane, this polymer electrolyte membrane, uh, is electron insulating. So the protons only migrate across the membrane. And then the protons and electrons meet up together to recombine with the oxygen to make water, right? And so each cell gives about a one, one volt. And then uh, as you pull current from the cell, the cell voltage goes down, but then you generate power. And sort of how these things work in practice is that you don't have just one cell, but you have many cells that are stacked together and those stacks are placed in parallel. And so these are modular systems, right? So each stack, uh, each cell that I stack up, right? The cell voltage becomes additive. And then each stack that I place in parallel, the current becomes additive. And so you can create a power plant uh, with a given cell voltage and current. And then the current times the voltage gives you the power, right? That's the rate at which we do work. And then uh, what's really important, uh, you'll see in these like fuel cell stacks by Ballard systems, is that there'll be an inlet and outlet for coolant from a radiator. And one reason why you need a, uh, we're not burning a fuel with an oxidant, we're, we're generating heat to create work, we're doing electrochemical reactions, but there is heat generated in these electrochemical reactions. And so you do need to manage heat within the cell. And so a radiator is used to uh, provide uh, heat management. Uh, so this is a very nice paper that recently came out uh, by Amit Kusaglu and other co-workers at the uh, U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, this is a Nature Energy article. It was like released a few weeks ago. And uh, they really talk about um, heavy duty transportation for fuel cells, why, um, you know, this is, really makes sense. And what's really interesting, if we look at light duty vehicles or passenger cars and light duty vehicles down here, so we have maybe a large van that would like deliver goods. Uh, here you would be a sedan car that you would drive. The, the power stack would range anywhere between 100, you know, 80 to 200 kilowatts, right? Um, for those Americans, like, what well, you know, what's a kilowatt? Well, one horsepower is roughly three quarters of a kilowatt, okay? And then, you know, as the vehicle, like I said, gets heavier and needs to go longer distance, uh, that uh, the power of the stack, right, um, uh, needs to get larger, okay? So for a heavy duty vehicle, we go 150 to 400 kilowatts. Uh, if we think of shipping, four to 60 megawatts, you know, these things maybe have to cross oceans, uh, trains that go across country or aircraft, right? And so the thing is, as these stacks, uh, as these, uh, the amount of power needed from the stack gets larger, the stack gets bigger. And so, that uh, creates uh, one of the challenges that's created is heat management with this. And so uh, this is an important thing to uh, consider and is central to our, my talk today. Uh, I'll return to this in a second. So um, if you look at uh, heavy duty vehicles, this is from Department of Energy. Um, 
one key difference between uh, fuel cell power plants for uh, light duty vehicles or sedan vehicles versus heavy duty vehicles is the cost and the stability. So um, the cost per kilowatt for a heavy duty vehicle is not as severe as it is for a light duty vehicle, largely because if we go back to this previous slide, that with heavy duty vehicles, because they're on the road so much, it's not the capital cost for the vehicle and to make the stack, stack that's so important. It's more the operating costs. And those operating costs relate to the driver of the vehicle and the fuel uh, usage. So going back here, one thing you'll notice is that the fuel efficiency for a heavy duty vehicle is, is close to 70%, whereas with a light duty vehicle it might be more like 55 to 60%. So uh, you can relax the constraint on cost, but you have to do better in efficiency. And then this is the one thing that's perhaps arguably the biggest challenge is long-term stability. So a light duty vehicle might be, um, you know, sedan vehicle about 6,600 hours of stability for a uh, class A tra uh, tractor tra trailer, we're looking more at like 25,000 hours of stability. Um, and so one thing, uh, uh, if we're making these fuel cell stacks larger and larger, then we're going to need a larger radiator, radiator if we use the conventional low temperature polymer electrolyte membrane technology. But uh, if we can raise the temperature of the stack, right, then we can uh, have a smaller radiator. And so um, wh why uh, do we get a smaller radiator when we uh, raise the temperature of the stack? And that's because of uh, good old classical heat transfer, right? So your heat rejection uh, is the rate of heat uh, rejection is proportional to the temperature gradient, right? And so when we operate the stack at a higher temperature versus the environment that delta T goes up, and so your delta, uh, your Q uh, will go up, right? And so um, one thing, this if you're gonna use a larger fuel cell stack for uh, heavy duty vehicles or aviation or shipping, uh, you have incentives to raise the temperature of the stack. So uh, what's the big deal, right? Like why is, you know, why can't we just raise the temperature of the stack? And that's sort of limited based on the polymer electrolyte membrane and binder materials within uh, these field cell devices. And so uh, the, the most commonly used material is nathion or a version of nathion. These are called perfluorosulfonic acid groups. And so this material you have like a PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene backbone with, um, um, an ether side chain that's fully fluorinated with a sulfonic, terminal sulfonic acid end group, right? And so uh, nafion, these ion pairs are condensed or you know, not dissociated. If you add water, you can uh, dissociate this charge pair and then these protons can migrate and then provide proton conduction. But then the water sort of needed to dissociate these charge pairs or make percolated pathways for proton conduction in PFSA. Um, has to be almost like condensed water, okay? And so if you heat the, the cell above 100 or 120 degrees C, what happens is those uh, percolated pathways of condensed water uh, get severed, they no longer exist. And so what you'll see is your conductivity goes down. And so your ohmic over potential, your, uh, your voltage loss uh, can be determined here by uh, Ohm's law IR. And so the current is the, the rate at which you know, you're consuming these reactants, right? And then your area specific resistance here is the membrane thickness divided by conductivity. So if your conductivity drops, your area specific res resistance goes up and then as such, your ohmic over potential rises. And so with you know, the, the state of the art LT PEM technology today, you really can't operate at a higher temperature. And so what we do, what we need are new membrane materials and binders that uh, can operate at higher temperatures, but don't need condensed water for conduction. And so that's sort of where our research comes in a little bit. Uh, so we published a paper, um, well, two papers in 2020, uh, but this one down here, Gold Coast paper, is arguably the more important one, where we've sort of blended, um, and I'll tell you how we do this on the next slide, polybenzyl and mitazole with a polycation. This is a quaternary benzyl pyridinium polysulfone. Um, we sort of have a lot of expertise in making these type of polymers as anion exchange mem uh, membranes for alkaline fuel cells and water electrolyzers. Uh, but one challenge, this, this material is not very stable in alkaline media. That's sort of what I spent my whole PhD on. But uh, in acid environments, it's, it's very stable. Uh, so we blended these two materials uh, together. We get these nice forming membranes and it, uh, it's great, right? We can conduct, uh, we have great conductivity from negative 40 C 
all the way to 240 degrees C, and we can thermally cycle it back and forth, right? And the conductivity is um, quite, quite good. And then uh, we can actually take this membrane and stick it in a humidified environment. So with PBI, what PBI alone, right? If you put it at 80C, 40% RH, the water will supplant the phosphoric acid and the conductivity will drop. But here, this uh, cationic group has a strong electrostatic interaction with this uh, dihydrogen uh, phosphate. And it sort of anchors these phosphoric acids within the membrane host and it allows it to be uh, uh, stable at high temperatures as well as lower temperatures with relative humidity. And we have good stability in fuel cell devices. Um, so uh, the secret to sort of making this membrane, right, uh, relates to, uh, you can't just take the polycatenin PBI and, and mix it together. If you do that, it will gel up instantaneously. And so what uh, Gokul Venagopalan, um, he just defended a few weeks ago, and he'll be starting a postdoc position at NREL, um later this summer working on fuel cells and electrolysis, uh, he sort of came up with this idea, well, what if I took the you know, precursor, right, where the chloromethylated polysulfone hasn't uh, reacted with pyridine to make quaternary benzylpyridine and polysulfone PBI, right? So if we take these two polymers and we, uh, we make very nice stable solutions that mix well together, we can then uh, drop cast them and we get these nice looking membranes. Uh, an example is here. This is a reinforced version of this membrane with a, a membrane manufacturer in Delaware called Exergy. So uh, we're, we're really working aggressively on this membrane with hopes maybe someday to commercialize it. And then um, we'll do nucleophilic substitution after we make the membrane uh, by soaking it in a pyridine solution with ethanol. So the coral methyl groups will react with the pyridine to make pyridinium. And then we can then bid it with phosphoric acid and then use it in devices. Um, so our initial fuel cell demonstration uh, was encouraging, but not great. Uh, so we had reasonable power density. We could get close to 700 milliwatts per centimeter squared with hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, I, arguably what was the coolest thing is we could switch the fuel stream with 25% CO in it. So mimicking like a reformate or syngas mixture uh, and we could still get you know, 400 milliwatts per centimeter square in the cell. Um, so what happens at the higher cell temperature is that CO has a, less of a propensity to uh, irreversibly stick to the platinum catalyst surface. And so you can uh, sort of run this fuel cell on uh, different hydrogen fuel streams. Um, but you know, platinum loading relatively for a fuel cell is fairly high when make of platinum per centimeter square, but that's sort of the norm in the HT pen community with PBI. Uh, but if we you know, sort of look at my benchmark data from our group, this was actually taken by an undergrad who worked for me a few years ago, Troy Porter, uh, is now an engineer at Jacobs. Uh, he sort of insisted that his picture be taken in Tiger Stadium for the group. But um, we can get close about two watts per centimeter squared with hydrogen and oxygen uh, with a little back pressure, not as much, and um, use less platinum, right? So we're still far off from like matching the performance of LT pen fuel cells, but it's not bad and encouraging. Um, and then uh, we're not the only group. Uh, actually, I was encouraged to work in this area by uh, Dr. Yu Sung Kim at Los Alamos National Lab. So I visited um, Los Alamos in I don't know late spring of 2017, and uh, they had they were working on a similar concept or this you know right these polycation embedded acids and um, they use this polyphenylene A anion exchange membrane that they did with acid that I'm not showing here. Um, and then they come up with this binder material that's based on polyvinyl benzoyl chloride. And um, like us, they got close, they did a little bit better than us. They got about 800 milliwatts per centimeter squared. But then in 2021, this uh, or late 2020, this Nature Materials paper appeared where they're working with uh, Vladimir Atanasov at University of Stuttgart where they use these phosphonated ionomers, right? Polytetrafluorostyrene phosphonic acid. Um, and so by removing the phosphoric acid from the binder, right? So the liquid acid doesn't obfuscate match transfer the gas reactant. Uh, you, the, the phos there isn't so much phosphate running around to absorb to the catalyst surface. I mean, you still have phos phosphonate on the polymer, but it's less. They're able to boost the power density from 800 milliwatts per centimeter squared to up to 1.7 watts per centimeter squared. So, you know, within a few years, right, you know, about two or three years, they've uh, doubled the power density and they've gotten very, very competitive power density value. So it's impressive. So 
uh, I think these ion pair uh, HT pens with um, these phosphonated binders, which I'll be telling you a little bit more about today, um, have a lot of promise for this community. Uh, so we've synthesized uh, these phosphonated polymers ourselves. Uh, we weren't too certain at first if we could make the polytetrafluorostyrene phosphonic acid, PTFSPA. Uh, so we tried something a little bit easier where we took polyvinyl benzoyl chloride. So I like working with commercially available polymers. I mean, we can do polymerization reactions in my lab, but usually uh, for making MEAs, we, I like working with a commercially available polymer because we need more material. But uh, we take these, uh, both these commercially available polymers, we take a phosphite, we do nucleophilic substitution, and add the phosphite, and then we hydrolyze the phosphate, phosphite to make phosphonic acid. Uh, we basically just follow these procedures that are available in the literature. So for this bottom one, this is uh, the original Atanasic paper from 2017. And we use P31, 31P NMR to sort of confirm the attachment of phosphonic acid to the polymers. And then we can titrate the polymer uh, using an acid-base titration to get the ion exchange capacity. Um, and so I'll, tell, I'll be showing this a little bit later on, how we measure uh, the conductivity of these materials. We don't make freestanding membranes of these materials. We actually uh, deposit them as thin films on interdigitated electrodes and measure their conductivity. Um, we sort of do that because, you know, when they're formulated into the uh, porous electrodes, they sort of behave like a thin film or have structure of a thin film. Not in every case with every binder, but for the binders that we're using, it's the case. And so what we sort of notice is that this polytetrafluorostyrene phosphonic acid has a similar conductivity to this uh, quaternary benzyl pyridinium uh, polysulfone imbibed with phosphoric acid. So that's good, right? So we can uh, have a binder that has no liquid phosphoric acid, but give very similar proton conductivity. And then uh, this alternative polyvinyl benzyl phosphonic acid, this other material that we synthesized, the proton conductivity wasn't nearly as good. So the PTFSPA does better largely because these electron withdrawing fluorine groups like increase the acidity of this phosphonic acid. Uh, there may be even some charge conjugation. We're working with some MD simulation people on this, trying to understand why this material uh, conducts better. Uh, but uh, once we got this conductivity result, we stopped working with polyvinyl benzyl phosphonic acid. There's really no need to. Uh, uh, additionally, we threw this thing into a TGA and looked at thermal stability. And PTFSPA has very, very good thermal stability. We don't see an onset decomposition temperature to 300 to, until 340 degrees C. So that's that temperature is much higher than what we would use within, um, within the cell. Um, and so uh, very similar to Los Alamos, we can uh, take the same membrane, same ca uh, um, catalyst loading, you know, same catalyst, platinum on carbon, right? Same loading, same gas flow rate, same gas, the same cell temperature, relatively same back pressure. And what we went, we, uh, we increased our power density from 680, milliwatts per centimeter squared to 910 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And then when we look at the impedance analysis um, uh, taken on this field cell, right, we see that the high frequency resistance, because the same membrane are about the same, we've gotten a little bit better. Before it was about 15 milli ohms dash centimeter squared, it's now closer to 10. But our charge transfer resistance uh, really went down. It went down from about uh, 0.07 or 70 milli ohms dash centimeter squared to 30 milli ohms. So we cut our charge transfer resistance in half by just switching the binder. And so the binders have a really profound impact on the fuel cell performance. And so this is sort of uh, a segue into our second talk. If the, if the electrode ionomer binders are so important, you know, how could we study these materials more fundamentally as thin films? And so that's what I'll tell you about. And it's important to note that, um, you know, for the longest time with LTPMFCs, right, the same membrane chemistry is used as the electrode binder chemistry. Um, and, uh, but you, the properties for the membrane and binder um, might not need to be the same, okay? And so if we think of a membrane, right, a membrane separator for a device, uh, we don't want high gas crossover, right? That leads to mixed over potentials, okay? Uh, it needs to separate the two electrodes, right? Uh, so it needs to be mechanically robust. It can't form any pinhole formation, et cetera. Uh, especially where you have condensed water or a lot of water and then dry out, it needs to be mechanically robust under uh, humidity cycling. Uh, and then you would also want it to be, uh, you need to be electron insulating, right? And then uh, if we look at a binder, right, 
Uh, we want that gas reactant to access the electrocatalyst surface. So we actually want good gas permeability for the binder, not low gas permeability. Um, binders uh, need to be solution processable, right? So a cross-linked membrane uh, is hard for it to be solution processable. It can't be, right? And so because we're making slurries and other things of electrodes, you know, putting them on membranes or putting them on gas diffusion layers, they need uh, to be solution possible and preferably use solvents that can be used in manufacturing environments. So non-toxic solvents. So typically the most desirable solvents are like an alcohol water mixture. Uh, what's really important, uh, and I'll show you uh, here shortly, um, is that you don't wanna have a, a, a large interaction of the binder with the catalyst surface. And so there can be chemical moieties, whether it's the tethered ionic groups on the polymer or uh, RO groups, right, that can interact with the catalyst surface and sort of block reactive sites and hinder uh, electrocatalyst utilization. We want to minimize that. And then because they're used in electrodes and electrodes need to be electrically conductive, a binder that can be electrically conductive is a plus, right? So if you maybe can think of um, uh, semiconducting materials or a block hole polymer where one block's uh, electrically conductive and another block's ion conductive, right? And then uh, where some of the shared properties is that you both want them to have high conductivity uh, in the device. You need, they need to be chemically and thermally stable, not ex uh, swell excessively. Um, and so this is a, a follow-up article by General Motors by uh, Anu, uh, I, I can't pronounce his last name, Kank Kanad, by, uh, and Mark Mathias. And what they were talking about to really get to low uh, platinum loadings in these electrodes uh, what you sort of need is really good platinum utilization, and you need an improved interface between the binder and the electrocatalyst surface. And so if this is our polymer chain and we have these terminal sulfonic acid end groups, they absorb here to the platinum catalyst surface, and we have this large resistance of oxygen reacting to the catalyst surface. You know, could we come up with a new binder that might be porous, like Swiss cheese, where the oxygen gas could like fly through, it would have fewer ionic groups that it could absorb to the catalyst surface. And so it's really through this improved interface between the catalyst and the binder uh, that people really think that we would uh, be able to get to um, better performing fuel cell devices with lower platinum group metal loadings. Um, and so this uh, motivates our work in this area. And so here's our proton conducting membrane. Here, this gray particle is the catalyst support can be like graphitic carbon decorated with platinum nanoparticles. And these particles are held together by the binder. That's what I've been talking about. That's like this purple here is sort of like a glue or adhesive. And then this is a gas diffusion layer that allows the gas to permit to come through here. Uh, but the most important takeaway here is that porous, really, porous electrodes are really complex, OK? Um, and so we're going to study model thin film systems. And the question sort of becomes, well, you know, can you, you know, how much information can you take from these model thin films to sort of inform the behavior? Uh, going on in these porous electrodes. And so that's something that we actively and continually strive to work on. But uh, this is a nice SEM um, or electron, micro, uh, electron micrograph by Karen Moore at Oak Ridge National Lab showing Nathion. I showed you that polymer earlier coated on the surface of platinum nanoparticles uh, in a conventional uh, low temperature PEM fuel cell electrode. And then a collaborator of mine, Irina Zanyuk, uh, working with Adam Weber's group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, they use tomography, right? And this gives you more of a zoomed out view of the complex structure of these porous electrodes and looking at water distribution in there. So even though I'll be telling you about um, model thin film properties today, just bear in mind that you, we're still trying to figure out whether we can correlate those properties to what's going on in the porous electrodes. And, and I'll show you later that we think that it can, that we do get uh, some some properties we measure as thin films that uh, line up within an order of magnitude and qualitatively with the trends we see in porous electrodes. So it, it is exciting. Uh, so we're not sort of the only first group to do this. Um, so uh, Canal Caron's group, working with Adam Weber and Mike Hickner, um, and Miguel Modestino, he's at NYU, he sort of works on this uh, currently. Uh, they looked at what happened with Nathion when you confine it as a thin film by measuring the conductivity and um, the morphology uh, as a function of film thickness. So they measure the conductivity in the centrodigitate electrodes. And so what they sort of observed is that as you shrink the film thickness, you make it thinner and thinner, the conductivity would go down by orders of magnitude. Um, 
And then when they would look at the, uh, uh, the x-ray scattering pattern using grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering, the Bragg diffraction peak that you get from self-assembled uh, pathways of those ter uh, terminal sulfonic acid ion groups with water, uh, that pe uh, peak goes away as the film gets thinner, right? So what happens is those sulfonate groups will start interacting with the surface beneath it, and it can't form those percolated pathways needed for ionic conduction, right? And so it compromises conductivity. Um, so what I showed you before, remember, uh, was that conductivity data, right? So we do these measurements ourselves. Um, so we make these interdigitated electrodes in our clean room nanofab facility using conventional optical lithography. It's nothing complex. It's you know probably the way computer chips were made in the early 90s or before. And um, we load them into this humidity cell here where we can control temperature, humidity, and different gas reactants. Um, and uh, we use ellipsometry to measure the film thickness. And we can control the film thickness through the spin coating method uh, the concentration during spin, spin coating. Um, and so these conductivity values are much higher than naphthenone, but that's largely because none of these polymers required self-assembled percolated pathways for conduction, right? These are uh, random copolymers that form a hydrogen bonded network within the film uh, that for proton conduction. So, uh, so that's sort of nice, right? Like, okay, we can measure the conductivity of thin film polymer electrolytes in the electrodes. But what, we, what I told you about before is like conductivity is one aspect, but it's arguably not the most important. The binder can affect the electric, uh, the redox kinetic rates as well as the gas transport. And that's what we really wanna go after. And so could we measure how these binders affect those parameters of reaction kinetics and gas permeability? And then could we do it right without liquid supporting electrolyte, right? Or fabricating MEAs, membrane electrode assembly, right? If you make an MEA, of course, you can do a lot of correction to the, the cell polarization data and get it and, you know, or do fancier things like putting reference electrodes within, you know, these zero cap cells, but that's sort of arduous, right? Uh, and then uh, if you did it in a rotating disc electrode supporting liquid electrolyte, that supporting liquid electrolyte can mask a lot of the interfacial resistances and not really give you the information that you, you, you really want to get after, right? Which is the reaction kinetics and gas permeability. And that's where we're going here in this next part. And so, um, and it's really driven by the fact that, you know, right, we can make these conductivity measurements. It's sort of cool to see how thin films and the different material chemistries affect conductivity, but it really has a small impact in field cell performance. And I'll show you some of the current distribution modeling we've been doing with my collaborator, collaborators, Professor Jose Ramanoli and a grad student. I work with Luis Bruceno and Menon. And so uh, this is a polarization curve here that relates cell voltage versus current. And I've showed you this previously. And so the difference between maybe your open circuit voltage and um, you know, the theoretical um, can be captured by the partial pressure of gases. Uh, maybe if you have a little bit of hydrogen crossover mixed over potential and a function of temperature. And so your open circuit voltage and the theoretical cell voltage is informed from thermodynamics, right? This delta G is equal to negative NF. Uh, the standard potential. And then this current density value here, you know, for those chemical engineers in the audience, uh, can be related to the total molar flux of how we're consuming those reactants, right, through Faraday's law. All right. And so then as we pull current from the cell, we get this initial steep drop, right? And that drop uh, largely relates to uh, the reaction kinetics in the system, what is known as the activation over potential, okay? And so this activation over potential, we can use butler bulmer kinetics to describe it. And um, there's a, a contribution from both the anode and the cathode. Uh, in this paper that we published, we were able to uh, use uh, a zero D steady state model for this whole pole curve. But uh, what we sort of captured from the data was um, the, the concentration of carbon monoxide that would affect the polarization behavior, right? Um, and then uh, important parameters in the butler volmer reaction kinetics um, uh, is these transfer coefficients alpha and then also these exchange currents. The exchange current density is a, a proxy for the reaction rate coefficient. And so here we uh, model these things by ca uh, capturing uh, the surface area of the loading um, and then um, these reference values that we get from the literature. And then there's a uh, semi-empirical nature to these expressions where they capture the phosphoric acid content uh, within the electrodes, okay? And then uh, if we pull more current from the cell, oh, I should mention, by the way, 
what we really want, uh, before I tell you about these other two, um, activation over potential contribution, we want this dark black line to get close to the top, right? That would mean we get more power and we've minimized over the over potential. So the energy that we get, the electrical energy is the integral with respect to time of the current times the potential, right? So, or the power integrated with respect to time. And then the heat rejection is the current density multiplied by the difference between the theoretical potential and the actual potential. So the, if we can move this black line uh, up here and minimize all these over potentials down here, then we have a more efficient cell. So um, to the other two parts of the, of the uh, polarization curve, if we look in the middle regime, of course, the kinetics are affecting the, the performance of the cell. So these are the activation over potential terms, these dashed lines from the anode and cathode, or the cathode being more than the anode, of course, because uh, ORR is the sluggish reaction. Um, here, this middle part also has a contribution from the ohmic over potential relates to conductivity across the membrane as well as conductivity within the electrodes. And so that's the thickness of the membrane, the thickness of the thin film in the electrode and the conductivity terms, right? But that over potential is this dashed green line. And so you can see it's actually fairly small in relationship to those other over potential terms there. And then if we analyze the, the final area, this blue area right here, where we reach a limiting current, right? So we can change the cell voltage where we don't get any more current. That's because we become mass transfer limited. Uh, and so we can use a, uh, an empirical expression for the mass transfer control uh, region here, but it's largely related to the diffusion as well as the solubility of the gas reactant within the electrode, uh, really the gas solubility within the binder, right? And so um, what we want to do is enhance the diffusion or the permeability of those gas reactant species across the binder. Um, and so um, what I'll be telling you about here shortly is like, how do we make interdigitated electrodes where we can measure reaction kinetics and gas permeability as in, in addition to just uh, not only conductivity. And it relates to uh, making periodic nanostructure catalysts on the interdigitated electrodes through block copolymer templating. And so in block copolymers, right, we um, can form nanostructures of, of various geometries and periodic feature sizes. So if we start with a canonical uh, die block AB, if they're the same length relative to each other, we get the sandwich-like structure, right? But if blue is uh, longer than red, then we would get uh, red cylinders in the blue sea. And if blue is much longer than red, we get red spheres in the blue sea. Um, now, that gives you different morphologies, like lamella, cylinders, and spheres. But then the length of the total polymer chain, um, or the degree of polymerization, right, controls the periodic feature size that you get, right? And so, um, this is a phase diagram uh, predicted via self-consistent field theory. And out here, this outer line is the spinodal decomposition curve. So this is between the ordered phase and the disordered phase. This is from a nice paper from Ludwig Liebler in 1980. And so if you actually want to make smaller and smaller feature sizes, like if you want to make periodic nanostructure catalysts that are smaller, uh, you would want to make the degree of polymerization smaller. But you have to maintain chi n to be so high. So like for a lamella system, chi n needs to be greater than 10.5 and the strong segregation limit. Uh, so if you want smaller feature sizes, then you need a higher chi value. The chi value is the enthalpic interaction parameter between A and B, how much dis chemically dissimilar they are and like each other. So either, you know, in summary, it's just this is a nice platform for making uh, a variety of different nanostructure um, materials, and we've done that. Uh, so we've taken our interdigitated electrodes, and we've done block copolymer self-assembly on top of the electrodes and fabricated them into electrocatalyst materials. So this small paper will come online next week. It was just accepted um, over a week ago. And um, what we do here is that we, uh, we graft a random copolymer brush that will uh, is non-preferential to polystyrene, polytuvinyl pyridine. We spin coated uh, the block copolymer on top of the substrate. And then um, in one step, but not for all the steps, for some samples, we expose this block copolymer to iodomethane vapor, and this Menchukin reaction will introduce N-methylpyridinium iodide. And then we can ion exchange this N-methylpyridinium iodide with a chloral, uh, metallochlorate, right? So it could be, uh, the chlorate could be um, iridiate or um, chloroplatinic acid. 
and we get this metal ion loaded into this one block here, but it doesn't come into the styrene block here. And then uh, after we've uh, loaded those metal ions in there, we can then use a reactive ion etcher to reduce those metal ions to metal oxides. And then we can use argon plasma to reduce the metal oxides to metallic uh, platinum. We would do that for platinum, not for iridium, because then for iridium, for a water oxidation catalyst, we want it to be in the oxide form. And then as a control, we didn't do this methylation step, right? We just took the polystyrene polyethylene pyridine and we uh, expose it to uh, chloroplatinic acid, the proton and chloroplatinic acid, protein and pyridine, and you get this metal loading. But if we do this alkylation step, which nobody had done before, uh, we get much greater uh, platinum loadings and thicker metallic structures, right? Uh, this bottom one was done, um, it was a Nature Nanotech article by Jillian Buryak a little over 10 years ago, but nobody had done this one up here and let alone done electrochemical measurements on interdigitated electrodes. So Deepa Bhattacharya, my grad student, uh, did this work. And so what we have are these uh, platinum nanowires, or iridium nanowires, uh, on the current collectors of, the, of these interdigitated electrodes. And so uh, in this image, here are the block polymer templates, right, um, uh, on the top row. And so here uh, we can control the periodic feature size, like I told you before, through the degree of polymerization. So these are smaller feature size. It's a periodicity of 22 nanometers. Here's a periodicity of 70 nanometers, but then because the metal ions only go in the one block, you can cut these values in half to get the feature size. So we get like 12 nanometer nanowires here. And then if we use those non-alkylated block polymer templates, right, these are the corresponding uh, platinum nanostructures that we get on the interdigitated electrode. These are standing cylinders. These are not lamellae. And then if we use the alkylated block polymer template, you'll notice like in these images that those mesoscale structures, those platinum nanowires tend to be thicker. Um, and then what we do is uh, use grazing incident small angle x-ray scattering. This is done at the advanced photon source. We see that the block hole polymer template um, scattering pattern is transferred into the metallic nanostructures. We see the different uh, Bragg diffraction scattering peaks with the same Q spacing. And so the structure of the block hole polymer template uh, is, remains intact when we turn it into these periodic uh, platinum or iridium nanowires uh, over a large area. And then uh, we use XPS to sort of monitor the evolution of the structure. So this is the coral platinate that's in the block hole polymer. This is after the reactive ion etching step with uh, oxygen plasma. So we get platinum oxide. And this is after we've etched with um, argon plasma to get platinum. And then uh, we see that the carbon from the block hole polymer template goes away through the various etching steps. And then if we change the metallochlorate to uh, iridium, right, we see this as the iridium chloride. And then after exposure to oxygen plasma, we get iridium oxide, which is a good water oxidation catalyst for water electrolysis. And then if we were to take a zoom out picture, right, we see this um, nanostructure uh, platinum nanowires over a very, very large area. And if we look at the FFT, we get um, several different uh, halos and peaks uh, indicating long range order. Um, what's sort of nice about having these structures um, being so periodic, we can actually use image J to sort of determine the perimeter, the 2D surface area uh, from these electron micrograms. And then we can use an atomic force microscope, right, to get the height images. And then using this, uh, the surface area from uh, processing the SEM as well as the height from AFM, we can actually get the actual surface area of our catalyst. Uh, and then in another experiment, which I won't show you today, where we, uh, we do microwave digestion with aqua reagia and an ICP OES to quantify the platinum ions um, in solution. And then we can back calculate that to the platinum mass loading uh, per area. Um, and so we can get very, very direct measurements of the mass loading and surface area without having to do uh, an electrochemical experiment with hydrogen or CO stripping. Um, and so we are really interested, okay, you know, what, what, would these structures work, right, when they're on these interdigitated electrodes, and they do. Uh, if we put a drop of perchloric acid on the IDE, and this interdigitated electrode here has um, iridium oxide. So it's a platinum current collector, okay, with iridium oxide nanowires uh, on the surface. So if you look at this IDE where we put no bias, it looks identical to this bare IDE, which just has a platinum current collector. There's no nanostructure on the surface. Then if we put two volts on this interdigitated electrode, we see we get a ton of bubbles being formed from water splitting. Whereas this bare platinum IDE where there's no iridium, we don't have that good water oxidation catalyst, we only get a few bubbles being formed. And then if we look at 
the CV, right, um, I'll show you the current density values here short, or the voltage values here shortly, but it goes up to two or three volts. The, uh, the current density we get with the IDE with the radium oxide nanostructures is substantially higher. Um, I don't like working with perchloric acid, so I substitute that perchloric acid with a naphium polymer electrolyte film. So we put a thin layer that's roughly 10 nanometers through spin coating. We then load that into our environmental chamber and then we feed in water vapor. So this is water electrolysis with vapor now, no liquids. And um, what we sort of see here in this bottom uh, current versus voltage curve, right? Uh, we see onset potentials that occur north of 1.5 volts. So there's chloride in these salts and I think that's sort of hurting our kinetics, but it's still pretty um, you know, promising that we can discern uh, differences in reactivity based on PGM types. So the platinum nanowires tend to do better than the platinum nanowires. And then uh, if we have platinum nanowires on the gold current collector, gold isn't very good for HER, platinum is not all that great for water oxidation. The performance gets worse. And then obviously if we have the IDEs with no uh, nanoscale catalyst from the block of polymer templates, the current response isn't all that great. Um, and then uh, if we look at a different uh, reaction, such as a hydrogen pump, where we do hydrogen oxidation as well as hydrogen evolution, right? Um, we use a gold current collector as opposed to a platinum current collector. Um, and we do a control experiment where we took a bare gold IDE with hydrogen and then the current density is really poor because naphion creates this acidic environment and gold is very, very bad at HOR, HER and acid. And then if we take the platinum nanowires on the gold ID, but we feed it nitrogen, we get a very, very low current response, right? So you wouldn't really get, expect to really see anything quite frankly. And then if we uh, took the IDEs with the platinum nanowires with different mesoscale morphologies, I'll tell you what those are here in a second, we can discern reactivity differences based on the mesoscale structure, which is really cool. And then uh, if you look at the current density, the absolute values for the non-alkylated templates versus the alkylated. So those alkylated templates gave us thicker structures and taller structures. We almost have an order of magnitude or you know, five times higher current density response for a given voltage over the non-alkylated system. So that alkylation step really makes a difference. And then uh, we can uh, take those different morphologies. So these are cylinders. These are uh, 12 nanometer platinum nanowires. These are 40 and uh, 25 nanometer platinum nanowires. So only at really low uh, periodic feature sizes do you get enhancement in mass activity. We can calculate the mass activity values. And so these fully colored bars relate to these alkylated templates under here, whereas these shaded bars re, uh, correspond to these non-alkylated templates. And then we can plot mass activity versus specific surface area activity. And what sort of was really interesting, what we're still trying to investigate is that the cylindrical mesoscale morphology gives a higher mass activity, even though it has a lower specific surface area, which is sort of uh, was a little surprising to us. Like this value makes sense to us because this had the highest, uh, for the lamellae forming system, the highest surface area. Um, and then thus it would have uh, a, a greater mass activity, it has better platinum utilization. Okay, so you know, can we take this platform to now maybe study the electrochemical properties of uh, ionomer binders? And I know I'm running out of time, uh, so I'll try to wrap this up here in a few minutes. Uh, so what we've done is take those uh, nanostructure catalysts and put the different various binders on there and run hydrogen pump, HOR, HER. And so you can see here with the PTFSPA, we get a very, very much higher current response than the acid and the polycation. And then we can actually model the system using that current distribution anal analysis I showed you previously, and it fits really well. And then if we, uh, what we can do from this linear regime, uh, following a procedure by Nairland and Gas Tiger, we can sort of get like what we call like an experimental observed exchange current. It's not the true exchange current because we're looking at both reactions on the IDE. Uh, but that exchange current for the PTFSPA, you can see is much higher, right? This idle current. And then when we increase the temperature, it goes up, but it's uh, the increase in the exchange current as a function of temperature for the acid and the polycation is, is quite small or, or negligible. Uh, and then if we look at the limiting current of those uh, IV curves, we see that the permeability goes up for the hydrogen uh, across the PTFS PA binder as opposed to the acid and the uh, binder. So the bottom line here is this removal of phos acid um, uh, from these binders enhances the reaction kinetics and gas permeability, which is what we expect. And it explains our polarization data that we that I showed you earlier in our fuel cell, which you see here again. And so now that we have the information on the anode side and the membrane, we're still working on the cathode side, we can uh, fit our polar, this is what we showed you previously. This is our newest data now. 
we can fit our polarization curve and then we can isolate those individual over potential terms that re relate to reaction kinetics, ohmic transport and gas reactant transport. And uh, the biggest gain we see by adopting this binder is that we have a substantial drop in the activation over potential. So removal of the phosphoric acid from the binder, uh, from the electrode layer, um, reduces uh, the polarization in the electrode layer. Uh, here, the over potential due to uh, concentration polarization is also reduced. But if you look at the ohmic over potential, largely because the membranes are the same, the conductivity of these two materials are the same, uh, it doesn't change all that much. And so the benefit of using this type of binder over this one is really relates to the kinetics and the gas permeability. Um, so I'll, I'm going to uh, just wrap this up here. I mean, we've, we've studied these in hydrogen pumps with the two different binders. Um, what is really cool, uh, we're running a 100-hour stability test with this current booster and, and gamma potential stat A channel. This is the most important instrument in my group. But we have the best H2 pump data for HPPEM out there. We can pull an amp at set one amp per centimeter square at 50 millivolts. Um, and we're doing a lot right now on long-term stability for gas separations and compression, which I can't share with you today, but hopefully we'll have some stuff coming out on that over the next few months. And then um, back to this idea, you know, could we take the information from the IDE to inform what's going on in the MEA of an H2 pump? And uh, when we look at the gas permeability data from the IDE with the MEA from the H2 pump electrolyzer, it's within the factor of two to four, right? The values. If we look at those exchange current density values where we normalize it per platinum loading, it's within a factor of five to 10. And so our argument is that IDEs are a high throughput cost effective platform for DAOs selecting the right binders for MEAs. They use 100 times less platinum, a small amount of binder, and they don't require bulk membrane or cell testing hardware. So that's why we like using them. And we think this hydrogen, uh, why we're working on this is just this broader use of hydrogen in the US economy, whether it's making ammonia for fertilizer, metal production, uh, grid scale, energy storage, et cetera. Um, I'm going to skip over the machine learning part. We'll just go to my conclusions. Model thin films of electric catalysts and polymer electrolytes are used for establishing structural property relationships and generating a large library of data, of materials data that we're using really for machine learning right now. So we had a paper on this topic um, come out uh, early this year. We have another one in preparation where we're using transfer learning, fuel shot learning, so we can fit all that Los Alamos fuel cell data with the machine learning model because we trained it with our existing data. We had to do nothing quite frankly, it just recognized the data and knew what to do with it. And then we're gonna do this for optimization. And then um, we really think this is important for the rational design of electrodes. Elect you know, electrodes are, are critical to the performance of these units. And uh, what we're hoping that the, uh, this data, both at the materials level, as well as the device, will accelerate the machine learning tools that we can use to help uh, inform the design of new materials that enhance performance. So with that, you know, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I know I'm a little bit over, uh, but I want to acknowledge uh, the U.S. Department of Energy for funding this work, the students who did this work, mainly Gokul Venagopalan, uh, who just recently graduated, Deepra Bhattacharya, Subhar Nicole, and Luis Bertrano Mena, uh, who was co-advised or advised by Professor Jose Ramanoli. And thanks to Joe Straska at the Advanced Photon Source for the GI Sachs, and then Yu Sung Kim for encouraging me to work in this area. He's a volunteer partner in the DOE Award and Hung Fei Jia, another volunteer partner in Bandam Barhar, who is working with us on reinforcing the membranes. So for that's it. Thank you for your attention. Be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, it was great. Thank you, Chris. Um, it was really informative. Uh, I, I know we have we do have some time for questions. Um, and so I can even kick it off. Uh, but if you do have a question, I'd encourage you to raise your hand and then one of the co-hosts can unmute you when it's time and you can ask a question or you could type the question into chat and we could read it to Chris. So let me uh, get started here. This is from OP. Can you please comment on the binder loading for the high temperature versus the low temperature MEAs and how the high temperature binders tolerate room to freezing ambient conditions at the startups engine go through prior to operating at high temperature? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, our binder, just to answer the first one, our binder loadings are 30% by weight in the electrodes. And that's a little bit higher than like from the LTPEM baseline data I would show you. We do 20% with Nathion. And we haven't done any optimization work on the binders yet, uh, just because we're 
you know, sort of a limited operation, but that's on our to-do list. And then the second part of the question in terms of, you know, what about the low temperature and startup? What we do know um, is that for the acid and bib systems that they can conduct at really, really low temperature, okay? Um, this drop in conductivity between like 40 to zero is actually uh, acid and bib polycations. Like the conductivity will reduce, will go down with the presence of water. So we're not really controlling the water in this environment very well. And so once we go to lower temperatures, the partial pressure of water externally goes down, conductivity goes back up because water isn't available to disrupt the hydrogen bond network. Our conductivity, of course, goes down and down, but we can still maintain you know, 20, 30 millisiemens of conductivity um, for the bulk membrane separator at negative 40 C, okay, or 10, 15 millisiemens. Now for the binder, for the, uh, I would think the QPPSF acid and then binder, you would see a similar effect, but for the PTFSPA, I, I don't know the phosphonate ion or binder, and that's uh, something we need to work on. We've uh, talked to people at GM, I know this is an important thing. There's other things too, like if you shut down, you can have condensed water in the cell would at least leach the acid out of the membrane. Uh, these are all practical things uh, need, that need to be investigated, but uh, right now in the scope of work for our DOE project, it, it's not there, uh, but perhaps down the line. Okay. And additionally, uh, what is the controlling parameter for binder stability in the electrode? Yeah, there's a lot of things. I mean, I think the chemical the chemical makeup of the binder relates strongly to the thermal stability. So we know from the TGA that this material is very stable. Okay. Um, and I can, you know, I don't want to, we, we were, this picture I was showing you, I took this morning because uh, it was running, right? We are at the end of a 100 hour stability test at, at 200 degrees C for our hydrogen pump. Okay, I won't tell you what we're doing with it exactly because I don't want to give that away, but uh, we know the binder right now at 200 degrees C for 100 hours is stable. Um, like the, you know, we don't really see any voltage um, increase in the hydrogen pump. Now it might be, turns out to be like five or 10 microvolts per hour. We have to do the analysis, but um, we know it's very stable. Um, and I think part of it has to do with, and at least in the hydrogen pump, uh, you don't have water or oxygen. So, you know, oxygen and water under fuel cell mode, you can make hydrogen peroxide and then those hydrogen peroxide can go to reactive oxygen species. But then you have this fluorinated styrene ring that might enhance the stability, even though you have these labile CH and CH2 groups. So that's again, another thing we'll look at. Uh, the fuel cell stability is part of our DOE award for year two of our project. Okay. Uh, other questions? I know Jerome had one. Jerome, do you want to ask yours? Yeah, I can. Um, thanks, Chris. Uh, that was, I learned a lot. Um, my question was on the actual makeup or the dimensions of the IDEs. I was wondering how you chose the, uh, the spacing between the fingers and if you had ever, if you had done some kind of optimization on that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's, I have a slide on this. Um, so one big concern you would have is like, uh, if you have the catalyst in the trenches of the, of the IDs, which we also do, not just the current collector, like could you short the IDE? And so uh, Mark Stoikovich, um, he has like an academic tree connection to me. Uh, he published this nice ACS nano letter where they use the block polymer where they wet etch out the polymethyl methacrylate, they evaporate gold, and then they um, uh, do the lift off of uh, styrene. That's, that's a little tricky here, but uh, what they looked at was uh, the shorting uh, as a function of the channel width between teeth, right? And so, um, you know, as the channel width or, uh, or the channel length, sorry, the channel, the distance between the channels, the channel length. And so uh, when the channels get um, really long, 100 microns, the fraction of disconnected cat uh, metals is almost 100%. So you won't have any shorting. So that's one reason why we use uh, a channel length of 100 microns for our teeth. Um, and then 
the other reason we use the dimensions, quite frankly, we haven't optimized for the reaction kinetics and gas permeability, but those dimensions were sort of based off the canal Quran paper for conductivity. Now, in another paper for conductivity, or I think we never published that work, um, but we, that's because we were doing this to inform the impedance spectra for our conductivity measurements, but we have, like using E-beam lithography, changed the dimensions of uh, the, the electrode width, the electrode length, uh, et cetera, for conductivity. Uh, but you can make those measurements. I don't really know what the optimal values are, but um, it's something we, we can consider in the future and perhaps worth considering. Uh, that's perfect. I mean, that's exactly what I was thinking about. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Do we have, uh, I did have another question, but not technically related to the material, but somebody was wondering if your PowerPoint slides would be available. Um, yeah, I mean, they can kind of, the only thing was just this material advances paper hasn't come out yet. I mean, like we're in, we submitted this revision. So it was like a little dicey for me to, so I might not share that part, but, uh, the other parts that are all published, I'll, I'll amend and I can share it. Just, I can maybe send it to you or, um, that person yes. can contact me, either one. Yes. If you, if you send it to me, then we can, we can make it available. I would appreciate that very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, more questions. Uh, no, I don't. I don't see any more coming soon. I don't know if we going over. People had to leave. I know we lost some already. Uh, but if nobody has any more questions, then. Uh, Chris, I want to thank you for doing this today. This was great. Uh, it's really nice to see some, you know, I'll call it hardcore electrochemistry here. I know it's electrochemical engineering, but it's also nice to see the underlying theory uh, developed too. Uh, so with that, I uh, wish everybody a great day and uh, look forward to our next uh, webinar that should be in just a few more weeks. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Thank, thank you, Jerome, again, for the invitation and for everybody's questions. It was nice sharing my work and uh, the discussion. And again, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, I'm happy to discuss. Thank you.